Monday, everyone. How are you guys? Allison, you are super festive. You got to show off the whole thing. It's, uh, it's puppy paws, guys. Like, it's not enough just to be Halloween. We have to be puppy focused here. I love it. I love it. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us today on this Q&A session. We're excited to help you with your puppy hiccups or troubles or worries or overwhelm or whatever it may be on this fine Monday morning. Uh, how was your weekend, Allison? It was, it was great. Lincoln and I got out for a lovely walk. I just got to tell you a story about this. We went to our favorite park, which has like these big soccer fields and he just loves the grass and it's great. We show up and there was like 18 soccer games going on. Oh boy. <laughs> and Lincoln's like, hard pass. No, thank you. So, I mean, I saw the tent set up and everything. I thought, no, no, this is not going to work. Well, across the street from this park is a, um, like a trade school. And actually my daughter goes there completely empty, like not a soul in sight. I'm like, this is perfect. perfect. We parked in the parking lot. We wandered all around. There was lots of things to smell. There was absolutely nobody there. Lincoln had a very lovely walk. And I just was reminded that it doesn't have to be a park. It doesn't have to be grass. That's but right. He really benefited from just really interesting smells in a in a parking lot. <laughs> That's right. How many of you guys that are watching now uh, have gone on a decompression walk with your dog as a recent... I mean, go ahead, let us know in the comments how many of you guys have gone out. Now, I don't know if you've seen the video or not, what kind of qualifies as a decompression walk, but it's definitely not on your short leash and it's definitely not in your, your own uh, neighborhood or even your own yard. There's something very specific about the, you know, the, the decompression walk. So if you haven't seen that video, we'll have Caitlin, uh, one of our team members here, share that in the chats with you. In the meantime, where are you guys tuning in from? <laughs> we just kind of jumped right into our, our presentation or our, our, our spiel, but we forgot to ask you guys, where are you tuning in from? Go ahead and let us know that in the chat as well. I hope everybody had a chance to see the um, little Halloween video that you put together. It's in our Facebook group. It's um, pinned to the top and it's a really helpful, just a couple of minutes of kind of some tips on what you might do with your puppy tonight, what you might not do. I know we're kind of party poopers on this one, but we're here to advocate for your dog. So uh, trick-or-treating with the puppy is, sorry, not recommended. Not um, but we did have some good tips on what you can do, kind of manage the doorbell and also be real careful with candy because it's going to be on the ground for probably a couple of days and you don't want to uh, get that random chocolate bar ingested. That's going to be a that's going to be a bad day. Yeah, that would for sure be a very expensive vet bill. Um, you can find that video inside our Puppy Training with Michelle Lennon Facebook group. Um, you can also find it on our Facebook page as well. So those are two places that you can go to watch that. What to do with your dog tonight on Halloween. Um, what not to do. So those are those are, those will give you some ideas. Oh my gosh, we've got some people tuning in. We've got, uh, let's see here. Hello, Loon. Uh, we got oh, I, saw, I saw later in this chat, Loon is in Chile. Hola, Loon. Oh, hola. <laughs> awesome. Great. I love it. We have a lot of international students who are tuning in. How many countries uh, are you, do you have students in, Michelle? We are in over 60 countries uh, across the globe. Wow. Yeah, we awesome. have a lot of students all over. And viewers, of course. We have all of our viewers as well. We have someone in Missouri. Very nice. Awesome. All right. Well, today is a Q&A session. This is for you guys. So feel free to put your question in the chat or in the comments, and we're going to try to get through as many as possible here in the time that we have. Um, so get typing, type it out, see what you've got related to puppy training. I mean, I mean, I guess if you want to know who we are and, and what we're about, you can ask us that kind of question. I might pick and choose which ones we answer, though. I'm not sure. I'm not sure too many people are interested in that. But if people want to know some stuff, that's fine. Um, I will give you guys a pro tip. If you can give us the age of your puppy uh, when you ask a question, that's always a really important fact that kind of plays a lot into our answer. Absolutely. Yeah. Give us some information on your pup so that... We know right at, like uh, Elena here with her first question. We've got a four month old puppy. She's addicted to you. Oh my goodness. Oh, no. I mean, <laughs> you work. <laughs> we do love puppies who love us, but sometimes a little too much. <laughs> Absolutely. You work from home and you try to leave her to self soothe, but she becomes destructive. Okay. How do you correct her without it becoming reinforcement of reactions? Awesome. This is a good question. Um, so, we do have a video that I think would be very helpful for you about working from home with a puppy. 
in that video, we talk a little bit about how we're going to start to get the puppy to be away from us for short periods of time to start and then slowly increase that duration. It is a slow and steady process, and it typically involves playing the games in module one of our 30 day to puppy perfection program, um, especially the crate training. And you can apply you can apply the crate training games to puppy pen training as well. So I'm, I'm not sure what your setup is at home. I don't know um, where, if you're using a crate or if you're using a pen, if not, we highly recommend it. Um, otherwise, when our pups don't have like this designated place to rest, they become restless and they tend to um, get up and pace around and move around. And sometimes they get a little more anxious. So I would say we, we probably should start there. Um, Elson? Yeah, the, the, the key word here is destructive. So it sounds like she's maybe getting into things. Maybe she's chewing on pillows or, or couches, or sometimes the, the guys, the pups go after the baseboards. And that's definitely something that we want to prevent because that just becomes a habit and it's not good for her and definitely not good for your, for your right. home. So I would be really curious as to if there's a pen or a puppy proofed room that this guy is in. Yeah. And then the second part of your question, how do I correct her without becoming reinforcement of reactions? So we want to shift our mindset just a little bit. We definitely don't want to correct our puppies or get into that mindset of bad dog. No, you're not allowed to do that anymore. What we do want to do is come up with the prevention, right? We're going to prevent this from happening. How? Like Allison was saying, maybe a puppy proof room, a crate or a puppy pen. Um, we're going to manage. So anytime she's out of those spaces, we're going to keep an eye on her and continually redirect. And in the meantime, we also have to provide our pups the right outlets. So if your puppy continually chews, are we giving them the appropriate things to chew on? And I'll be honest with you, you are going to be redirecting probably hundreds of times before they go, oh, you want me to chew on this bone instead of that baseboard. Okay. It's going to, it's going to take some time for sure. Um, the, the other thing, I think I said it right. Enrichment. We, we have to make sure our pups have the right outlets throughout the day. So I would say, um, Allison, which video would be the best explainer for that one? We've got 150 or more on this channel. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about this. So I see that um, Caitlin has already uh, linked the working from home with a puppy, but there's another right. video that came out mm, the last couple months. It's called um, like what to do when your puppy won't listen or oh, kind of yeah. frustrated with your puppy. This is a really good one. It's a big overview of kind of digging into why is my puppy doing this? What, what might be missing in either my own training or in the puppy's life? And then how can I prevent the behavior and especially because I see here that um, Elena said that she's chewing her bedding and the baseboards and right. that there's not a pen yet that those two videos um, are really going to be helpful for you about working from home with a puppy and like what to do when your puppy isn't listening. Yeah. It might not be as easy to kind of piece it all together, but that's where we can help you. If you kind of get through those and need a little bit more help, we can help you more at the at the course with the course. Yeah. Yeah, puppies at, at about four months, um, most can't be trusted with a bed yet. Um, yeah. My um, Pickles, he, he's over here sleeping. He, he was three before he was allowed to have a bed because he would just destroy them all. So yeah. it's not uncommon to not have, you know, not be able to give your puppy a bed yet. Yeah. I do just want to um, say one more thing, Michelle, what you said about the puppies who are, you know, op kind of in this open area and they're kind of wandering around. Lincoln is 100% that. If he is you know, even when we're home, he can be very unsettled. And this happened last night. He just hadn't napped very well yesterday. He was kind of, or, 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 you know, he's kind of unsettled with people moving around the house. And I put him in his crate. I was right there. I put him in his crate and closed the door. And he was like, oh, okay, I guess I'll take a nap, which is exactly what we were looking for. But had I left the door open or had I let him just kind of snooze on the living room floor, he just kept getting up when people would wander through the living room and it wasn't helpful for him. So I really recommend that crate or pen area to kind of settle them down. For sure. Awesome. Well, that's, that's good that you, uh, you, you saw he had a need and you fulfilled it. <laughs> yeah. 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 It takes a while to figure those things out, but when you start to really watch and say, what is, what is happening? What's the day been like? Oh yeah. Maybe he's needing X, Y, Z. Yeah, it's a it's a puzzle, but uh, we believe in you guys. We're trying to give you all the tools to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> all 
Um, if you guys are just tuning in, it is a Q&A day, Q&A session. So we're going through some questions that you guys have submitted here in the comments and in the chat. So hang tight because uh, you might get your question answered if you don't have it in the chat already, mate. You might see one that's very similar to something that you have going on. So yeah. with let's, uh, you. let's take another one here. Loon from Chile is uh, asking about her three-month-old husky. We've crate trained him for a week and he's been good, except when I go to the shower, he cries. Oh, okay. He doesn't fear loud noises and objects, but fearful around other people. Okay. So okay. 12 weeks old. It uh, sounds like maybe he's been home for a week. It sounds like, or they've been crate training for a week. Okay. And then, yeah, I mean, at, at 12 weeks, this is very normal, very common. You know, the, the pup really left everything it knew before you and, you know, with their litter mates and their mom, it's kind of like they were plucked out of one foreign land and dropped in another. So it's going to take them some time to transition into the new home um, with you. And that also what we were kind of just going over and talking about before, uh, working on this involves small increments of time. So duration, small increments of you stepping away for short periods. So the shower might be a little too much too soon. And you're like, wait, I need a shower. It's very possible that we have to pick nap times, you know, times the puppy's already sleepy to try to do those types of activities while outside of that, we're working on building up that confidence for our pups. Um, mm -hmm. Also doesn't, doesn't fear loud noises and objects, but fearful around other people. You're in what we call the critical imprint period. This is a very important time in our pup's life up to about 16 weeks when everything is the most impressionable for our pups, which means we want to create as many positive associations with all of these things that they're experiencing, people, places, sight, sounds, smells, textures, uh, as possible. So I would say, um, we actually, we have um, a newer video as well on confidence building. We were using a puppy jungle gym. That's one thing. And I know you're, you're saying they're fearful around people. Um, I would say if you can do what we call, um, you know, well, we, we usually call them victory visits where you're going someplace and having something positive happen, like a vet's office or a groomer's or something. But for you, you might actually just go to a parking lot, and like a parking lot where there's not a lot of traffic and not a lot of people. You're going to hang out kind of far back. And we call this back behind our puppy's threshold. The threshold is the point in which if we go too close to the scary thing, in this case, people, our puppy tips over, they can't handle it. They're in like, ah, get me out of here mode. Too scary. So we want to hang back behind that space. And what we might do is every time puppy like alerts and sees people, we're going to reinforce. We're going to give some tasty treats. And when the people go away, the treats stop. So on the, on the, the first time the puppy sees the people passing by, treats are given. So now we can start to make this one-to-one -one positive association with people at a distance. And one thing to keep in mind, we do not need, we don't have to have our puppy go up to meet other, we, the interactions don't need to happen. As a matter of fact, the more times we attempt to have an interaction to try to help our puppy overcome this fear, it's actually causing setbacks. And it's gonna take a lot longer for your puppy, if at all, to build up that confidence. So we wanna make sure we're going slow and steady and at our puppy's pace while we're working on this activity. Yeah, the the uh, point about um, taking a shower, we promise it won't be like this forever, but uh, like Michelle said, you know, sometimes we have to break it down into much smaller pieces. We have the, um, is it the Mississippi game? Is that the one where you step away for just a short period of time? And yep. for some pups, we're talking seconds. Other pups can kind of start it more like, oh, my, I can step away for a minute or two. It really depends on the dog, but not pushing them past that point of, of comfort and keeping them in that comfortable zone while still learning is really important during this training period. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, I think we had one from uh, Go Running with Oliver. Um, that one came in. Oh, let me see if I can find that. Let's see. Oh, sorry. I, I scrolled down. I got distracted. I'm just like a puppy. I get very distracted. All right. Let's talk about this one. Okay. Uh, my 10 month old puppy barks at every person walking by on our neighborhood walks. How do I get her to not bark so much? Ooh. Okay. Yeah. 10, 10 month old puppy barking at every person going by. This is, there's likely um, some accidental reinforcement history that's already been developed. And so I like to explain this in what we call the mailman theory. So this is, um, it might start off with somebody kind of passing by, or the mailman, just passing by, delivering the mail, going to the next house. In the very beginning, the pups are kind of like, oh, person, hey, what's going on? 
then there's nothing that's really happening because it's not like your mailman's coming in your house and interacting with your dog. So what tends to happen then is the, the puppy starts to alert bark and then eventually it transitions to barking and in the puppy's mind, they made the mailman go away. So because the mailman has to go from your house to the next house, this cycle starts, this, this habit has formed where then the puppy realizes if I bark, I make the people go away that pass by. Now, you know as well as I do, that's not what's really happening. But the dog is getting sort of what they consider, it's reinforcement. It, you know, they, they barked, the person went away, and it just happened to be because that was the path in front of your house. So I would say uh, for this particular one, we want to make sure in the very beginning we're preventing that behavior from being from happening or we allow it to happen. So we want to block off access right now because every time puppy's allowed to say, go bark out the front window or go bark at that front door, the habit's becoming stronger and stronger. Outside of that, we're also going to need to work on some counter conditioning, meaning we're going to start to teach puppy, just like we were talking about before when uh, with, the, with the last person about sitting in a parking lot, people going by, positive association. We're going to start to do that as well. I would recommend for you too to sit in that parking lot and, and participate in that type of activity. Um, and then it can start to translate at home. So we actually, in our pro level, we were working with one of our students on that not that long ago, where they had to build up to being able to sit on the front porch and watch people go by. And it took some time, but they were able to really shift the puppy's mindset on this whole thing. So right now, puppy is in kind of this reactive mode. We want to get puppy to go, person, hey, good things are going to happen. Right now, the puppy's mind is not thinking that. Mm -hmm. This is also where that threshold concept comes in, where there's probably a certain point. I, I see that her name is Emma. There's probably a certain point where Emma can see a person and not react. It probably has to do with the distance. Maybe you're across the street. Maybe you're a block away. She can see the person and just kind of be curious, but not actually go to a bark. But if you were crossing, like passing people on the sidewalk, maybe that's too close. And I have that with Lincoln. There's a certain threshold that I know of him where he's okay. He's like, eh, that's, that's pretty interesting. But if we get too close, it gets kind of intense for him and then he will react. So that threshold concept really plays a lot into, um, into this. Yeah. All right. All right. Let's, um, okay. let's take this one. This is a common issue. We've got mm -hmm. a five month old puppy. How do I prevent my puppy from going after elk, rabbit, deer, cookies? Sounds like deer poop, rabbit poop, elk poop. <laughs> when I take her out for decompression walks. Oh yes, those oh, are, yeah. uh, so the smell of those, I mean, believe me, you and I are all like, no, 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 thank you. But our puppies think this is fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, th this is, this is, um, it, I, there's not going to be one thing I can tell you to do. That's the, that's the problem. I want to say just ta -da, do this one thing and, and it'll be good. It's actually a combination of things. One of the things that it'll be it'll include is when we call it the engage and disengage game. It's really teaching our pups that they could see the thing, but then check back in with us and they get some reinforcement for that. And the reinforcement obviously needs to be good, you know, significant enough, higher enough, um, val more valuable than than the other thing. And I'll be honest, if our puppies already had a good amount of time of of engaging with these things, you know, trying to chase after the elk and the rabbit. And a natural instinct for our dogs is if they see the fast furry moving thing, they're going to want to chase after it. So we have a lot of, you know, undoing to do. We might even in this particular situation, um, find different places to go on those decompression walks that you're probably not likely to, to encounter them. We have to do that for a while while we're working on the other skills to get our pups to focus in on us and leave it. You know, that might be a cue to, to work on. Because if we keep putting our puppy in that situation where they have access to seeing a deer or a rabbit or an elk and cookies, cookies on the ground, um, each consumption of it or each interaction with it, again, building up that habit, making it stronger. So yeah. I know this, I wish I had like a, just do this one thing. And this is where it's, it's not gonna, not gonna work that way. We have some, we have, again, like we said in the last question, we have to shift our puppy's mindset to think about the thing in a whole different light. And we also have natural instinct, meaning our dog's natural instinct to go after those things. 
I don't want to say working against us because we have to work. We have to figure out how to make that work to our advantage. That is definitely something that we do a lot with our pro, uh, students at the pro level, where we can really hone in on what skills your puppy is good at and what you've been doing already, and then how to start shifting that around. So that's something that's going to require more personalized support. Yeah, it, it is really hard, this kind of leave it training, because it is so exciting and interesting for the pup. But also this has to do with trying to prevent it before it happens. Um, you know, walks are work. Like, you know, I, I frequently see people listening to podcasts and talking to friends on the phone while they're mm -hmm. walking their dog. And, and I know that it, it's tempting to be like, oh, I'm going to get my steps in. Or I'm going to make a phone call. And but especially, you know, when we're in training mode, we really have to be pretty tuned in to what's going on with the pup, you know, whether it's reactivity or if it's something on the ground. And, you know, if you are coming up on something that you think could be those little cookies from a rabbit, we just turn them the other way. And with that leash training, the dog just follows you. So prevention is going to be uh, really, really helpful here. Yeah, I was out on a, a decompression walk um, on, a, on a pretty decent, like a, when I say decent trail, it's a trail that's got a lot of scent, uh, a lot of animals pass through there kind of thing with my standard poodle yesterday. And he kept stopping, he kept sniffing. And my daughter was like, oh, why can't we just, why does he have to do that? Why does, the, you know, she's 16. <laughs> why does he keep doing that? And I said, this is his walk. This is his walk. And so anytime, you know, he stopped and sniffed, we would stop and just hang out there until he was ready to move on. Now we came upon, um, I have to get a little graphic here. It was a little bit of a chunk of a deer. I think it must have got caught on something or maybe it was bitten by something, but it was just, it was a little piece of the fur and skin that was laying there on the ground. I did notice it before Wesley did. So I was able to capture his attention and have a little giddy up in my step so that we could quickly move past it. But that is something we've practiced in training, too, to kind of teach him, like, oh, if we do this one thing, oh, I better pay better attention. Oh, something exciting's happening. And as soon as we pass that, he got some jackpot reward for that, you know, mm -hmm. whether he saw it or not. I know I did. I'm sure he picked up on the scent for sure. But I was more exciting in that moment than that thing. So that's something else to build up as well. The more training you do with your pup, the more value you become, the more excited they are to engage with you. And then for situations like that, you kind of break out with your whatever it is that gets them riled up and excited about you. You'll use it during that time. And that can be really helpful. Yeah, just one more thing on that. That's the nice thing. It, the games in our online course, I mean, obviously, we, we you know, propose these games for to be used in certain circumstances, you know, go zone is when you're walking and leave it is for when you want them to leave it. But so many of these games, you're like, this is a game. We're good at it. I'm going to use it where I need it. I use bump it out on walks to get his attention. There's just a lot of different games that you can apply in whatever situation you're in that we may not be able to predict for you. But as you get better at the training and you and your dog get used to working together, you're like, oh, I, I know how to get his attention. I'm going to do this game right here, right now. And then we're going to be able to kind of band-aid through this situation. So anyway, that's the nice thing about um, having a, a, some training games that you and your pup are used to working with. Yeah. Very good. Did you see Barb's question? I was just going to give that one to you. That's a super yeah. interesting question. I love that. And, and we've actually been um, doing a few videos about specific breeds. And the research into these videos has been very interesting. So what do you think? How would you answer this? All right, uh, so is, this there, is there a breed of dog that changes how you work with them, especially maybe size, given that her pup is pretty small? Yeah. Yeah. So for in general, all dogs need training and the training that we do in our program has been used on every single breed out there. It's positive association, science-based, relationship-based training. That's the style that we use. We don't use old school, scary stuff, no compulsion, no f getting the dog to fear us or be forced into doing whatever it is. So all dogs can benefit regardless of breed from that style of training. When it does come to different breeds, though, we do have to, pl that plays a little part in it. Uh, we don't want it to be the sole focus, though. So, for example, chihuahuas being a little bit smaller, we might have to modify what we do to work with them. So we might end up sitting down on a stool, not maybe necessarily getting all the way on the floor, but sometimes that towering over the top of them can be very intimidating. 
So we have to figure out a way that we that they feel comfortable still engaging with us. Um, we don't do a lot of picking our small dogs up either. It's very typical. We see that often where people are like, oh, if I just pick them up, I'll, I'll stop whatever it is I don't want them to do. Pulling on the leash, barking at somebody out on a walk. We want to teach our dogs what we want them to do instead, because sometimes the more picking up means the more negative association they might have with being handled, especially if it's how we pick them up. In situations before, we've we've helped students um, who've had our smaller dogs, you know, our Yorkies and, and Chihuahuas and, and little pups that are like two pounds um, with not only the technique or what we call the mechanics of training, but sometimes including some tools like a target stick or a spatula with, with some peanut butter smeared on the end. So we're not necessarily leaning all the way over to deliver something, but maybe they could get a little lick. So sometimes there is, um, you know, there's some things we need to do for our smaller dogs that we might not necessarily do for the big dogs. Right. Sometimes it's just the the physical part that we have to work on. The other thing is just sometimes just recognizing if there was some type of activity that this breed is likely to be interested in, you know, beagles like to sniff um, and, you know, providing those opportunities to see if your dog likes those things too. I have part chihuahua and he loves the kind of like, it's almost like a rat terrier kind of thing. He loves that kind of finding things and he loves to find the toy and the blanket and he shakes it and and so we we give him these opportunities to play these games mm -hmm. so that that kind of natural instinct comes out and it doesn't come out in ways that I don't want. So less about the breed, but more about what does your individual dog like to do? And, uh, you know, are you able to provide that in a way that's productive? One thing we do see most often with our small dogs is people do tend to, and I'm not saying this is you, Barb, totally not you. You're here, you want to learn. So I know this isn't you, but uh, with the smaller dogs, they tend to either postpone training a little bit, waiting for them to get a little bit older and a little bit bigger. So they, you know, think, um, or they think they don't need as much training as a big dog. A two pound chihuahua is going to need the same kind of training as a 200 pound mastiff. They still need socialization and exposure, um, traditional uh, cues and you know uh, behaviors like sit and down and leave it and coming when called and leash skills. Um, so I would say we see it most often where people are waiting to train and we encourage you not to because the problems that may come or the problems that will come down the road are going to be even sick, more significant than they might already be now. Mm -hmm. um, Chihuahuas tend to be a little more of a nervous breed. They tend to be more reactive in the bitey department partially because again, we're towering over the top of them. Hands are always coming at them because they're so darn cute, right? They're so stinking cute that people just don't even realize how anxious or nervous they might be. So they just kind of invade their space often. So we want to make sure we're working on that whole, be an inviter, not an invader. And that's one thing I want you to take away too and tell others, you know, as far as interacting with your dog, just making sure that you're being a good advocate for them. You know, oh, hold on, we're working on training, put that hand up, tell them that, you know, stop, don't try to come pet my puppy, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I think I, given that Lincoln is part Chihuahua, which we didn't really know when we got him, that's a long story. But I think I, um, if I had done anything differently, if I had known, I would have done a lot more of the positive exposure um, training, knowing that maybe he was going to be a little less confident, just kind of with all the things in the outside world. And he's doing really well with it. Um, I'm a really strong advocate for him not getting pushed too far. But if I had known, I would have done a lot more work at that eight to 16 week point to kind of expose him very positively, not too much to just to some new things in a way that kind of helped him grow a little more confidence. Yeah. But we train the dog we have in front of us, right? That's right. <laughs> Whether you have them at eight weeks or 18 weeks, we work with the dog we have. Yeah. And you guys are here to learn. And when you when you know better, you do better, right? Yeah. So we just keep soaking up everything that we're given out tips wise. And you guys are going to be on the right track for sure. Yeah. All right, let's help Ashley if we can uh, get a little bit of advice here. My puppy just turned a year old and won't stop chewing on our wooden deck. We have tried sprays and they have toys. Yeah, yeah. So um, it, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I shouldn't assume, but I'm going to. It's possible that your pup might be out there maybe for a little bit unattended or you've, you know, maybe sent them out to play and you, or maybe you're out there and you're gardening or something and you, and, you know, you, you don't have eyes 100% on. It's very possible. 
um, we do see that most often where, you know, the dogs are kind of trying to figure out what they should do with themselves. They sometimes get a little bored and this is where, you know, they, they start chewing on decks and, and lawn furniture and things like that. So I know that you've put toys out there, but my question back to you is how much engagement with those toys um, are you included in? How much involvement are you, um, are you, are you doing with them? So if, for example, you know, I were to take the toy out with my guys and just kind of put it out in the yard and be like, here's your toy, here's your toy, kind of get them excited about it, toss it and then turn away. They're not likely to go engage with it on their own. That's just a natural dog behavior thing. They, they, they want some involvement. They're social creatures. They want that involvement with you. The other thing, and this goes for everybody, we actually don't recommend that you send your dogs out alone without mm -hmm. supervision. There's so many things that could happen, such as chewing on things they're not supposed to, eating things and consuming it, such as rocks, mulch, um, you know, moldy things that could make them very sick. We're talking like uh, mushrooms and things like that in the yard. Um, in addition to that, you often miss key signs of health problems when you don't watch their when they go to the bathroom, when they poop, you know, you're they're believe it or not, your dog's poop says a lot about their health. So if we're not able to see that happening or watch it or you know look at it in, in a regular basis, when something happens, it's often I don't want to say too late, but it's like it could have gone a little bit differently had we had we noticed it sooner. We could get into the vet sooner. We could maybe get them on some medications, whatever it may be. So I would say in this particular situation. The other question to ask yourself is how much enrichment, how many enrichment activities or how much enrichment does your dog get? So how many decompression walks do they get a day or a week? Um, what other activities are they, um, are they shown to do? Like any, are they allowed to dig in a dig pit? Do you play with the flirt pole to, to um, engage them in chase? Um, do you have a snuffle mat at home to, in, you know, allow them to, to sniff and, and forage? Um, so those are other activities that should be a part of our dog's daily life as well. So enrichment isn't just puzzle toys. It's think about an enriching life for, for yourself. And what does that include? When you're happy and healthy, it usually includes safety, security, so you're not anxious or nervous, activities that make you happy, um, food that's good for you, um, secure, just all sorts of things, security. Uh, so I would say making sure we fulfill all of those needs throughout our dog's day can be very helpful in stopping unwanted behaviors like chewing on the deck. And as far as those bitter sprays go, I don't recommend them. I mean, they're just, they're not going to work as well. For some dogs, they do. For most, they don't. And in addition to that, it's what we consider an aversive tool. So it it's temporary. It's sort of like a Band-Aid. You're going to spray it, but and if, and if your dog doesn't like it, it's going to evaporate and you're going to need to apply more. But that's never really teaching our dogs what we want them to do instead. So I would say, what do you want your dog to do? Can we start channeling that activity and energy into something you do want them to do? And then again, that how much are you engaging with them? The only other thing I would say, Michelle, also is that the, the dog is clearly enjoying this activity there. They continue to do it. And so while training them to do something else, we're probably not going to allow them to have access to that area because they'll keep going back to it. It's a habit at this point. You know, it just becomes just this behavior and to the dog. There's nothing wrong with it. Right. So we usually recommend just to make it, you know, easier on you and your training, blocking off access to the thing that's triggering your dog to do the thing you don't want it's just going to be a lot easier um, and a lot more fair to the dog. Yeah. We often talk about mindset shifts in training. Um, and this is one of them. This is the, we don't want to try to suppress the behavior or tell them, no, you're not allowed to chew. We do want to give them outlets to chew. It's very much like if a dog was digging holes in the backyard, we're not going to say, no, you can't dig holes because it's a natural instinct that they want to do. So if you tell them no, they're just going to find other other ways to do it, which might include digging at your couch or your carpets inside or just doing it in an unsafe, safe area. So we want to provide outlets. So to Allison's point, if you if you see chewing, what are we giving our dogs to chew while they're outside? So it does fulfill that that urge. Yeah, it's a hard one. It's not it's not a quick fix. It definitely involves some time and training, but um we, we can do it. We can get there. It just takes a couple of different approaches all at the same time. Yep. 
Uh, let's go to um, Tracy. She has a three-month-old golden doodle. Um, she's got to go to work for four hours at a time, and she uses pads. I guess she maybe says she doesn't. Maybe she says she doesn't like pads, but I have no choice. Um, will I be able to break this if my work schedule changes? Hmm. Hmm, this is a tough one. Um, oh, I I always feel bad telling telling people that pads are really going to pee pads are really just going to continue to encourage them to go in the house. So the habit is becoming stronger and will be much harder to break. Um, if, if at all you need to use something like that, I might consider um, it's called fresh patch or you can make one yourself at home, something with real grass. So it might include, um, you know, some sort of pan or tray with the grass inside that your puppy is allowed to go on. And that way you will have an easier transition when they do need to go potty outside. Now, as far as the time that you're away and such a young puppy, we would highly recommend that you get some, you know, maybe ask for some help, another helping hand. So whether that's you hiring a pet sitter or dog walker, or just having a family friend or even a neighbor come in to help your puppy, it's important, especially during what we were talking about earlier, that critical imprint period, that they have that social engagement and interaction with other humans too. So that helps them to be, you know, a, a happier, healthier, um, more confident puppy, the more engagement they get or more exposure they get during this critical imprint period. So I would say if possible, let's either include or introduce the fresh patch um, or have somebody else come in and help you out. Mm -hmm. That way you I don't have to use keypads pads anymore. Yeah, I think it's so hard because when we think about having a dog, we do think about, oh, I'll be able to, you know, leave for a couple of hours, go to work and I'll come home and, and I'll have the dog. And that's definitely true of an older dog. But we just always have to remember that at the early stages, you know, pretty much under a year, but definitely under, you know, four or five months, they have different needs. And the things that we do with them during this time make a much bigger difference than if we were to do those same things later. Like the timing is critical because of their development in their brain. So, um, you know, not missing those windows of opportunity that kind of set the stage for how they feel about things for the rest of their lives is really one of the most strong messages we wanna, wanna give you guys is, it's gonna take a little more work when they're young, but you know, it benefits you for the rest of their life and they benefit from it, so. Yeah. Anyway, it's it's a it's it's a bit of a part time job uh, having a puppy. Yeah. <laughs> you don't really control the hours, uh, but it is not last forever. And as they grow, it becomes less of a part time job, and it's a little more easier because you get to know them. Yes, I, I do. I, I promise you. <laughs> you right. can see them just sleeping here. Same. It does get easier. They do settle in. Uh, well, I don't know about you with pickles, but Lincoln and I had some time this morning. He had breakfast. We had some snuggle time. We were playing on with the flirt pole before this call. Like, so, you know, I, I fulfilled those duties. That yeah. is my responsibility with him. And in return, he is taking care of business, sleeping behind me. I love thank, it. Thank you, boy. <laughs> we do. We have these things that we need to do during these wake windows. And, and if they're missing from our dog's schedule, we do start to see um, other behaviors that we maybe don't like. They're very natural for our dogs, but we're not giving them the right outlets during those wake windows um, to, to help them be able to settle during times like this where you need them to be quiet on a, on a Zoom call or a yeah. meeting or something. Except if the doorbell rings, it's all over, guys. <laughs> Sorry, we're still still working on that. <laughs> all, all right. right. Um, I want to give you some information about this question, uh, Michelle. Three Seattle Musketeers, uh, okay. first of all, wanted to let you know how much they love your advice. Uh -huh. um, they have an eight-year-old eight, week, eight year old rescue. Okay. Part Chihuahua and Jack Russell. He plays with other dogs at a friend's house. But then what they're saying is he's not good socially. Overall, for example, on walks, if other dogs smell him, he snaps at them. Okay. So it sounds like he's got a few besties when okay. he's staying at the friend's house, but these maybe unknown dogs are out on walks. It's not going so well. What okay. Would you Remember, he's eight years old. All right. Yeah. Eight year old pup. Um, I am going to, I am not going to sugarcoat this. I'm going to be a hundred percent honest with you. Um, not all dogs like other dogs and we don't have to make them like other dogs. So I would say if you are experiencing this on a walk, it's no more interactions with other dogs because what's en what ends up happening is every interaction that's negative is like, 
like uh, an investment in the bank of reactivity. So that means that the dog is going to just become even more stressed and more reactive. And at eight years old, is it possible to work on this and fix it? Yeah, possible. Uh, it's possible. But why do we need to? Why do we, you know, if he has some good friends, uh, puppy playmates that he enjoys hanging out with, we shouldn't, we don't need to stress them out. Any, I mean, at eight years old, we don't need to stress them out. So I would say out on your walks, it's going to be ideal to find places where he's not going to engage with them or just become even stronger of an advocate for him and just say, no, nope, we're not going to interact. We actually, for everybody, regardless of their puppy's comfort level on leash, no dog should be interacting on a leash. It's a safety thing. Um, you just never know when a dog is going to react. They might look fine on the, on the, you know, on the initial meetup, but sometimes what happens is opposition reflex, reflex kicks in. They feel that pressure right, on their harness or their collar, because you're trying to pull to slow them down a little bit, like, whoa, whoa, we don't need to jump up and say hi to everybody. So then they start to get a little frustrated. So then if two dogs who are a little frustrated meet face to face, head on, that could be very um, uh, challenging for each other. Not only does it feel like they are challenging each other, but it could be very hard for them to decompress in that moment, which then leads to leads to a reactive dog. Mm -hmm. um, so for safety purposes, and and we don't want dogs getting all entangled with each other because that actually causes more stress. And then the, the owners start to see the dogs are stressed and attempt to pull them apart. Oftentimes somebody gets bit and the dog does not mean to bite you. It's just re redirected frustration. So meaning they don't realize the hand there is you trying to help them. So they're just biting, you know, in this kind of frenzy and your hand gets in the mix of it. So in this particular situation, I would say it'd be far safer and help your dog be more comfortable by foregoing all interactions out on the walks. And then if you if you happen to, um, you, you come upon somebody who might be a good fit for, for a play date, yeah, I would ask some questions. You know, what's your dog like? What's their temperament? How are they with other dogs? Start to gauge this by doing what we call parallel walks. So you guys are on opposite sides of the street walking parallel with each other, see how your dogs interact at that distance before you ever get closer. And if you did decide to do an off-leash play session, it should be in a fenced-in yard in some place, maybe kind of, kind of sort of neutral, or at least a fenced-in yard where you can take equipment off and they can stay safe without collars and harnesses and things on. So Michelle, we've got a part two to this question. Oh, okay. Hold on. It's, it's well, a little wait, more complicated. More. <laughs> <laughs> you were okay. doing so well, but now we're going to throw a little challenge at you. Okay. Um, they, brought, they just brought home a nine-week-old Havanese uh, girl puppy. Um, haven't introduced them yet to the eight-year-old rescue, kind of keeping them in their own space. Um, but it sounds like um, Oreo, who's the eight-year-old, growls a bit and uh, has kind of snapped at this new puppy a little bit. So trying to figure out how to integrate a household now with an eight-year-old and a new nine-week-old. Well, first and foremost, kudos for keeping them apart for right now. I really I really love that. Um, and that's gonna be important for both the puppy and for, for Oreo, the older dog. Partially because we don't wanna, we, remember, puppy's in a critical imprint period. So if there's a negative reaction from your, dog, your older uh, resident dog to this puppy, we could have lasting effects. So we're gonna go slow and steady with this interaction. And so for that reason, I, I think um, introduction to an older dog, puppy and inter puppy introduction to an older dog might be a good one. And then I always, people always laugh when they say this, but our cat introduction one would be good too. Partially because we physically show you in that video on how to introduce, um, let's just replace cat with older dog in, in that video. I'd love for you to see that video. I'll have Caitlin share the link um, in the comments for you. So take a look at both those videos and start to formulate how we're going to slowly and steadily introduce them to each other. Because we definitely don't want to, you know, want a free for all. We also want to be careful that we're not necessarily just putting them on opposite sides of a gate or, or a puppy pen either. Um, barrier frustration is a real thing where they there's a barrier between them. They can't get to each other. And so they start kind of fighting and growling and, and they're super stressed at that. So this, for this reason, we're going to make sure they're back behind what we call that threshold. And we're going to do this one-to-one -one positive association at a distance. So that would be something. To yeah. 
there's a, there's a lot going on here. This is it's a little harder to kind of help yeah. you just with this format, but we're going to give like those resources that we mentioned um, can really help you. Um, we are actually really helping one of our students right now, Joan. She just got a new puppy. She her older dog is only a couple of years old. He went through the online course. Um, Sammy did. And now Baxter is home, brand new puppy. And so Joan has been, this has been really interesting. Joan has been submitting almost daily videos of the interactions or like the setup of the two and really asking some detailed questions of what is their body language looking like? Are they comfortable? Do I need to separate them? And getting some great advice. She is such a strong advocate for both of those guys to make sure that the puppy isn't feeling overwhelmed by Sammy's play style, making sure Sammy's kind of getting still time with his favorite human. So I would just say that if you feel like you need a little bit more help after watching the videos, you would probably really benefit from the course like Joan is with two puppies. I mean, two dogs in general uh, can really uh, use some extra support. For sure. All right, so many good questions here. Let's, I hope to get some more, um, a lot more in, but we'll, we'll only be able to do what we can. Let's, let's keep going though. Okay. Um, so we've got a four month old who <coughs> uses a pee pad in the house. Um, but also will go if they take her outside. So how yeah. do they get her to tell the humans that she needs to go out? Awesome. All right, everybody. We can help you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So first and foremost, um, I I uh, I want to send you to our free resource, the new puppy starter kit. It's a digital kit. Everybody can have access to it. I'm going to have Caitlin share the link um, in the comments for you. The reason I want you to look at this is because it has four videos in it and two of them are related to potty training. So there's a the potty training one. There's also a bell training lesson. So it's a way for you to get your puppy to signal to you when they need to go out. So those two videos alone will be helpful. And then there's also a printable packet in there. I think there's like 10 pages and it, and it talks about some potty training stuff. It gives a sample schedule um, for a puppy. So those two uh, videos in the new puppy starter kit are going to be helpful to, just to get started with that. As far as the pee pads go, if your puppy is going outside, if you take her out and she's going, I want you to just, I mean, we tell people all the time, you know, they'll come home and start using a pee pad. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Don't use it. It's very conflicting. Conflicting message for our puppies. Like, hmm, you want me to go in here, but you also want me to go out there. It puppy or potty training takes double to triple uh, to, to get through when we have a conflicting message going on like that, like pee pads and pee pads actually encourage the dog to go in the house. We want to avoid that at all costs if possible. So just pick them up, no longer use them. Um, really start to, you know, focus on the, the, the potty training video. Cause you'll learn what to do. Um, like if you're not home or, you know, how to, how to reinforce, we have four fundamentals of potty training. We encourage all of our viewers to, to follow. It really helps, the potty training process goes so much faster. Mm -hmm. And this is the perfect time to really <laughs> put in on those and make them kind of a habit. And uh, it will really help you. Yeah. Um, I, I just wanted to say thank you to Abby for the, uh, for the little tip. That's so nice of you. Oh, we're, you here, we're here for you guys uh, at, at no cost, but it does, you know, take some time and effort on our part, which we love to do, but we do appreciate the recognition. So thank you very much. Uh, while we're here, we'll take your question. Okay. Uh, 11 month old cattle dog. Uh, you've okay. watched the video on cats. Great. Puppy plays too rough with the cats. Okay. okay. Um, hard to keep them separate as my cat jumps over the gates, but the puppy will chase and body slam him. Okay. okay. <laughs> Poor kitties. <laughs> what do you is think, there, Michelle? What is, would there you any, do? is there any more question here that we missed or is it um, just in case I, I wanted to or was at the end of it? Oh, no, that's, that's a smiley right. face, I think. Oh, no, Sam oh, that's just a smiley face. Yeah, that's okay. the rest of the question from Abby. Okay. I think. All right, so all right. what do we think? Okay, so an 11-month-old cattle dog. So first and foremost, this is where I will say breed does play a big factor in this one. Um, just because, you know, cattle dogs notorious for herding, chasing, that kind of thing. That's what they were bred to do. So I want to make sure, though, that we're keeping our cats safe, too. We're, we're making sure that uh, cats have a safe place to go to to get away from our puppy. Um, so that would be the first thing. Is there is there a place that the cats can go that the puppy cannot? Um, the other thing is at 11 months, I'm not surprised that, the, that they're playing rough or the puppy's playing too rough. Um, it takes quite a while for the pups to start to figure out 
you know, that they might be playing a little too rough with the, with the cats. And I know sometimes what happens is they start, the cats start batting at the, at the puppy and just like, in, actually in the puppy's mind, encouraging more play and more bite. So I would say we want to, we want to set up separate spaces. We also, um, I would still keep focusing on that slow and steady introduction. I don't know how long you've been doing it. I know you watched the video, so that's awesome. I don't know how long you've been doing it, but I would say if they're playing too rough and you still see some chase action happening, we might need to go back and revisit that just a little bit more. The other thing too is, are we giving our 11 month old puppy enough of an outlet to chase, not the cat? So uh, are you using a flirt pole? Are you, um, have you introduced like, um, I'm thinking like they have a, like a yoga ball, um, that's very specific for, it's not a yoga ball, but it's a, it's a big ball. They use it. They, the game or the sport is called tray ball. Um, and so this would be my, maybe like a really good activity for you and your dog to do together to help teach your puppy to bump the ball or herd the ball. So it's giving your dog an outlet to do this very natural, uh, canine specific, uh, behavior that they, 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 they love. They would love an outlet to herd. Um, and chase. So between the flirt pole and the big ball, um, I would introduce those ones immediately if you can. Mm -hmm. um, and then I don't know how old the cat is, but I would say our older cats, um, they, they can become very stressed to a point of getting sick. So we want to be very cautious about, you know, the, the, the interactions together. I see often on social media, people saying, don't worry, they'll figure it out. Just let them go. This is the I, I, complete opposite. No, I do not recommend that technique because again, the, the cats can get very stressed to a point of getting sick, but then also they start other unwanted behaviors too, like going to the bathroom outside the litter box or starting to scratch things that they've never scratched before because of stress. Um, so it is you, your job is the, is the, you know, the, uh, the, what do you want to call it, Allison? Like kind of like puppy police, right. To manage mm -hmm. that so that they both can stay separate and safe. Yeah. Um, are you to also, another thing that kind of popped into my head too, is what other, do, do you set up puppy play dates for your dog to allow mm -hmm. that kind of engagement and interaction, that rough house play? So I would say finding another dog that is the right match for your puppy would be perfect. And so then what will happen is if your puppy has an outlet to kind of get rid of all that energy and have that interaction during the off time, after your puppy has expended all that energy with another dog or the chase, the flirt pole or the ball, then that would be a good time to work on the introductions with your puppy. I would say if, if your puppy is too revved up, those batteries are too full, that would not be a good time for the the interactions with the cat and the puppy. Mm -hmm. I know it can be really inconvenient if you're, you know, sitting down and having a cup of coffee and you got to get up and kind of, you know, be referee. But, um, you know, the more they do it, kind of like we were talking about before with building habits, the more they kind of have these interactions, the harder it's going to be to to change them. So you do have to be referee uh, as they're kind of getting to know what the, those boundaries are. And like Michelle said, give give that pup lots of opportunity to do those fun things, just not with a cat. Yeah. And, and even when they finally do get to a point where they can interact together, we still want to give what we call pauses in play. Now, whether this is a pause in play with your dog and another playmate or play date or this interaction with your cat. Pauses in play really just means you're giving each of the you know animals an opportunity to decompress and come down off that adrenaline rush. So play sessions usually for our pups are about 10 minutes or less. Um, so most often people think, oh, the more the merrier, the more exercise, the better. We can actually create, number one, a super athlete. By the more we allow them to do something, it's almost like the more they need going forward. In addition to that, we create an overstimulated puppy who's constantly on this like adrenaline high. We don't want that. We want to get to a point where we can teach our pups to decompress, to calm down and relax, especially in the presence of other animals. So that's something to work on as well. So I just wanted to um, notice Dave C and also Amrit, we see your questions very, very similar about play dates with other dogs. How do we help them not be so rough? How do we help them kind of from pouncing and, and kind of 
What if they want to go on for hours? Um, I think you got some good information from here. We were just advising Abby, but I think Caitlin will post the link to the puppy playdates video. This is a super interesting video that talks about how to recognize when playdates are healthy, when you might want to intervene, um, what, what you might look for in a play date, how you might find one. So I want to have you guys both take a look at, at that play date. Um, it definitely sounds like you'll want to kind of get involved a little bit because play dates that go on for hours do not benefit anybody. <laughs> that's going to be, that's going to be, if the puppies might do it. That doesn't mean it's good for them. Yeah. So um, I'll have you uh, take a look at that play date video, but I wanted to just, I can't let this one go, Michelle. I love this question so much. Um, we have a little Seattle time left. A little time. Okay. Three Seattle Musketeers asked this fabulous question, and I just I want everybody to hear the answer to this one. So what do we do about socialization before vaccinations are complete? The answer is immediately. Do yesterday, it. like two weeks ago, three weeks. How <laughs> start it, do it. Do yes. it safely. You can do it. You can. And we we have a video on that too, believe it. We we have a lot of videos. We take all your, your questions, your amazing questions that you guys submit, and we use those as opportunities to create some training videos for you guys. And so our whole channel is full of that. Um, but honestly, we even have one that's literally called How to Socialize Your Puppy Before Vaccinations. This is going to include um, even just car rides, hanging out in parking lots, um, <clears throat> not going to places where other animals hang out. So we're not going to, maybe if they're not fully vaccinated, you're not going to be walking at the park or walking on trails. Maybe you're hanging out at the school parking lot after hours or church parking lot after hours, um, just walking around the parking lot on, you know, on your long leash, like you would when we do a regular decompression walk, allowing them to sniff and explore. And you could even, I don't know, I've done this before where I've taken, you know, like a, a small handful, maybe like five pieces of kibble before I get my dog out of the parking lot, I might just toss them, allow them to like find them in the parking lot when we're walking around, you know, that's a possibility. Um, be careful though, because that could, you know, of course, our dog's going to start to see things on the ground and want to want to pick them up. This is something that I've done with dogs that I've, I've taught them to check in first. So they know the kind of like they see it, they look at me, I'm like, take it and they, they know that they can take it. But um, so yes, we want to get our dog socialized, exposed as quickly as possible, especially, I mean, during the critical imprint period, it's the most impressionable to have the longest lasting effects on our dogs. However, at six months, that's okay. You still have time. We still want to be working on this. Um, we even do something called victory visits. So maybe potentially going to your vet's office and it, just for the sole purpose of walking in the parking lot to start, <clears throat> sorry, I'm losing my voice, um, creating a positive association with being just in the presence of the, you know, the building, then maybe a visit or two later, then we get to a point where we might go up to the door, head in for a moment, get a cookie and leave so that nothing scary is happening. That's socialization and exposure training too. Um, you could sit in the car and watch trains go by or airplanes or buses or bicycles or people. People often think that socialization is all about going to the pet store and getting their dog exposed to as many dogs as possible. No, no, nope, nope, and nobody nope for that for sure. Um, as a matter of fact, we actually discourage you to take your puppy to the pet store, partially because sometimes people bring unvaccinated dogs there. The other thing is dogs are often pretty excited or even stressed. And pe most people who do not understand canine body language don't know how to read a stressed dog. Um, so then they, as you heard us say earlier, they allow the dogs to meet on leash, which we, we don't recommend. Um, and in addition to that, there are so many things to see and smell there that can be overstimulating, like all the toys and food that they can't get to. And it becomes like a kid in the candy store. You walk in and you're like, nope, you can't have any of this. And they're like, what? You're going to start to see a very stressed out kid, just like you would see a very stressed out dog when they can't get to all the things that they see and want, including other furry creatures, such as the mice or the birds or, you know, or all those things that wouldn't be safe if they got a little, little taste of them. That would not be good. Um, so Take a look at those videos for some really good ideas on how to work on socialization and exposure. So I'll have Caitlin share not only the one that talks about um, what to do before vaccinations, but then also the exposure one that just really kind of 
talks about it in a different way. Because again, mm -hmm. often people think that you, you need to go to pet stores or, or interactions need to happen. In order for socialization slash exposure to happen, an interaction doesn't need to happen. It does not need, as a matter of fact, again, we don't always recommend it. We want to slowly build up to that if possible, but it's not something that we go in the, with the mindset of my dog needs to interact with all these people and all these other dogs. And that's how they're going to become a well-rounded dog. No, because actually a, a dog that has all those interactions, but if all of them are stressful, now we've created a situation that has a lasting effect for their life of being stressed every time they see a dog. Mm -hmm. That video is so good because it talks about not only what you can do, but what you should do. I mean, it's not just, oh, you know, you can do this or you can do that before vaccinations are complete, but you actually should do because that timing matters. Um, all right, let's take this one last question. Very timely. Um, I think this would be a great one to uh, end on and let people know kind of how we can strategize for tonight. I certainly have a plan for Lincoln, who also is not totally fond of <coughs> new people all the time. Um, and you, you know, you don't want to make sure you want to make sure your 10 week old isn't getting overwhelmed. So okay. um, go ahead with this one, Michelle, what do you think? All right. So we do have a video on our Facebook page that we put up and inside the puppy training with Michelle Lennon Facebook group. That might be, uh, I'm going to go over a few things, but that might be a great refresher after you're done watching this. Just head over to our Facebook page and take a look at that, or you could join our free Facebook group too. Um, so if you get a lot of kids, we ideally, we have a 10 week old puppy. This means that if in any way, any possibility that we might just even for this year do something just a little bit different that doesn't allow that knocking and doorbell to happen all night long, that could be very helpful for your puppy. Otherwise, the stress of the people, the door, the activity, that could be a lot. So um, we recommend maybe sitting in your driveway and so the doorbell's not ringing or maybe putting the candy out, you know, before people have to come up to get to the doorbell or knock. Halloween is the second most common day of the year for puppies to go missing. And that's because that door is opening and closing frequently. The doorbell's ringing. The knocking is happening. People are in costume. It's very overwhelming for the puppies who have never experienced this before. And, and they tend to panic and then bolt. So we don't, we don't want that to happen. Um, let me just, do I, do I keep him in view of everything? Yeah, no. So we don't want to keep him in view of everything right now. That would be what we call flooding, meaning he sees things and sees things and see all night long. He's going to get to a point of overwhelm and overstimulation. One of the things we would love for you to do outside of tonight, outside of training, is we do want to create positive associations with these things, um, costumes being worn by humans, um, hearing the sounds of doorbells and knocking happening. On the night that it's happening, we're not in training mode. Puppy, puppy will not be learning as much as you would hope that they would learn. Instead, they're going to likely become overstimulated and potentially overwhelmed. So we call this the show. The show is gonna happen tonight. We have not had enough dress rehearsals to be able to go through a show and have the puppy be calm and relaxed and focused on you. So for that reason, we would love it if you're able to, before all the festivities type kind of start, puppy's been well exercised, has gone out for a potty break. Um, you maybe even keep puppy in a calm, quiet room with the lights dim in their crate with a Kong or a West Paw topple to lick so that they have something to keep them you know, occupied. In addition to that, licking can help decrease stress. So I would say definitely take a look at that video on our page, but also no, no involving puppy in tonight's festivities. Yeah. We don't mean to be party poopers, but we're here to advocate for what's best for your dog. We don't want to, you know, have you in a couple of weeks say, my dog is really fearful of new people. It seems to have happened after Halloween. Or freaks out every time the doorbell rings. Right, right. So we're, we have the benefit of knowing a little bit more of what's likely to come whether it's natural instinct for a dog or because behaviors have been created. And so we're trying to help you prevent those things because it's a lot easier to work on them when you're in that prevention mode than after they've already kind of established as habits. Yeah. So I see so many good questions in here. I'm so sorry we can't take them, but we have a great Facebook group 
where you can post them and we can direct you to a good resource. We have lots of really good videos here on this channel. Uh, Stephanie's asking about biting. We've got a great video on biting. Um, Natalie is talking about excited pee. Oh, we just have so many good ones. Um, so take a look at some of those videos. You can ask questions in our Facebook group and um, we'd be happy to help you there. And we're gonna be back again next week at this time. Awesome. All right, guys, I hope you have a blessed rest of your day. We'll see you next Monday. In the meantime, in, be safe, enjoy your evening, and have a great week. <laughs> Bye, everyone.